Welcome everyone to our webinar. We'll be getting started in about 15 minutes. We're looking forward to presenting Kaizen Culture with you, the power behind the Gimba. And that's gonna be presented by our Director of Human Resources, Chuck Cherry.
We'd like to welcome everybody to our webinar today on Kaizen Culture. We'll be starting off here in just a few more minutes. And it, this is going to be presented by our Director of Human Resources, Chuck Cherry. Welcome. Welcome everyone to Kaizen Culture, the power behind the Gimba, presented by our Director of Human Resources, Chuck Cherry. In just about five minutes, we'll get started. Thanks everyone for attending today's webinar.
Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Kaizen Culture, the power behind the Gimba. Uh, today's program is uh, sponsored by our uh, our collective team at, uh, at Kaizen, uh, and we're really proud to have our Director of Human Resources, uh, the talented Mr. Chuck Cherry, uh, presenting uh, for us today. Uh, the, the Kaizen Culture is is really a, a look at not just what uh, what Kaizen is and, and how it can help uh, improve organizations, but it's it's a look at how leaders can leverage this uh, throughout their their time uh, being leaders in an organization uh, and how how we can use this to transform and, and better our processes. Uh, just before we get started, a quick quick background a little bit on just uh, the word Kaizen and where it comes from. So Kaizen is is a very common uh, phrase that's that's used in the Japanese language. And it consists of two Chinese characters uh, that are that are used in the in the Japanese language, and uh, it's really introduced uh, to the the culture uh, in about the fifth grade or so uh, that uh, Japanese students uh, start to learn and, and understand the importance of of this concept, uh, and, and the children see this as, as just part of their everyday life. So you know, a teacher might say, "Let's study," or "Let's clean up." or let's kaizen, like let's improve the, the world around us. And that was really the use of the word uh, kaizen for a very long time. Uh, and then our founder, Masaki Yamai, introduced the word kaizen as we know it now in the 80s uh, through his book uh, as management terminology, meaning change for the better, uh, continuous improvement uh, change over time. Uh, and this is where many companies became more uh, more aware of, of this word. So uh, I, without further ado, we'll turn it over to uh, today's presenter, Mr. Chuck Cherry, and we hope you enjoy today's webinar. Thanks, Jesse, and welcome everybody to our presentation on Kaizen Culture. Uh, we're going to take around an hour today uh, and what we're going to talk about is really what the motivation is for people to do the work that they do. Uh, we're happy that uh, Kaizen Institute Global Consultants has uh, made us uh, uh, able to present this to you today. Uh, the, Kaizen, uh, the Kaizen company is uh, across the world. Uh, we're uh, we're available in uh, over or the six continents in 45 different industry sectors, and we have over 45 different offices across the world. And what we have is one culture, and we're happy to be able to talk to you about that today. So let's get into the agenda a little bit. Uh, let's talk about uh, what we're hoping that uh, people will get out of our uh, presentation today. So some of the learning outcomes that we've got, we want to talk about what the role of culture is in a Kaizen or lean management system. We want to talk about how daily Kaizen activities can play into that culture. And we want to also uh, follow up with uh, the impact that leaders Kaizen can have on an organization's culture. And then finally, we want to talk about uh, the, the main tool that we have to move culture along to a uh, Kaizen or Lean uh, methodology. And that's the conversations that we have with people every day. So we'll learn a few tools about how to improve that to uh, make it uh, our culture move along. So let's begin with, with culture itself. Uh, we talk, I'm in the human resources field, and uh, I don't know if you can see me on your screen or not, but uh, as you can tell, I've been around for a long time. And we've talked about culture for a long time, and we come up with a lot of different definitions about what culture is. But really, when it all boils down to it, you need to think about what is it that motivates the folks who do the work to do what they do best. And that's really derived from the culture in an organization. So if we want to perform at a, at a high level, if we want to be as efficient as possible, if we want people to enjoy coming to work and to be engaged and to give us the ideas that we might have, what we want to do is ensure that uh, our culture is one that will uh, allow people to bring their best every day. So that's what we're really looking for here. This is what we want to spend a little bit of time talking about because it has big paybacks when we get it right. So let's talk a little bit about what a definition of culture might be. So this quote, if you Google culture, 
uh, you'll get back millions of different hits uh, and there'll be uh, thousands of different definitions for what the world culture means in an organization. Uh, so here's one uh, that uh, we've selected for uh, for this presentation. Culture is the character and personality of your organization. Culture is what makes your business unique and is the sum of the values, traditions, beliefs, interactions, behaviors, and attitudes of the uh, organization and of people who run that organization. So that's what we want to talk about a little bit this uh, at the beginning of this uh, presentation is those words, values, traditions, beliefs, interactions, which really ends up with, uh, with creating the attitudes and behaviors that we have inside of our uh, organizations. So we talk a lot. We talk a lot about culture. Uh, uh, we're always talking about uh, the culture of an organization when we go to our various clients. Uh, when we talk to managers and leaders of organizations, what what's the culture like uh, in the uh, in the workplace? And so, why is that important? Let's have a look at uh, why culture might be important. And I apologize for the number of words on this slide, uh, but I thought it was important uh, as a uh, setup for the rest of the presentation to talk a little bit about uh, about why culture is important. So Robert Miller uh, is a fellow who is the executive director of uh, the Shingo Prize. Now the Shingo Prize is awarded to organizations who are deemed to be excellent uh, at uh, lean uh, and inst instituting the organizational changes that uh, lean brings about and continuous improvement. And uh, Robert Miller had this to say back in 2010. About three years ago, we felt we needed deep reflection. After 20 years, we went back and did a significant study of the organizations that had received the Shingo Prize to determine which ones had sustained the level of excellence that they had demonstrated at the time they were evaluated and which ones had not. And we were quite surprised and even disappointed that a large percentage of those organizations that have been recognized had not been able to keep up and not been able to move forward, and in fact had lost ground, had slid backwards. We studied those companies and found that a very large percentage of those we had evaluated were experts at implementing the tools of lean, but had not embedded them in the culture. So what Robert Miller was talking about was the efforts uh, that companies undertake quite often in going into a lean transformation will result in some excitement. Uh, it will result in making some vast changes over a short term project and uh, the tools will get implemented. But because the organizations don't put the energy into changing culture that's required, the changes are not sustained and the organizations lose a lot of the, uh, the value that they gain through a lean transformation. So what we want to ask ourselves is what do we need to do? How do we go about actually implementing a culture that will sustain lean in order to be able to reap the benefits of continuous improvement over the long term? So that's what we need to talk about. We need to talk about that with the understanding that if we don't give it the energy that it deserves, we can end up sliding backwards despite our best efforts to install the tools. And what they find uh, is that quite often organizations will gain some value from lean transformation, but they'll end up giving some back. And it might be as high as 90% of organizations don't get the full value of what they might have with lean because they don't focus on the culture change that's required to do it. So let's talk about what sort of uh, value we can we can attain through lean programs. So here's our uh, GQCDM targets uh, that we quite often talk with with our various clients. And we talk about uh, growth targets, uh, the usual things such as sales or, or creativity, revenue and earnings. We also talk about quality cost and, and uh, delivery targets, uh, flow efficiency, cash flow, quality numbers of that nature. But where quite often we find that organizations don't focus as much energy or don't come up with good measures is in the motivation 
uh, sort of targets. Those targets around people and culture and engagement. Uh, those are the ones that is the focus of this presentation here today. And we want to talk about what do we need to do in order to ensure that we're in enabling the basis for our people to capture all of the value in lean. So that's where we want to get to today. So the role of a lean management system, we have kind of a rule of thumb. It's sort of an 80-20 rule. Lean is 20% the tools that you implement and 80% management system. In other words, you can implement the tools. And when we, we're going to talk a little bit more about what those tools are, but we're talking about things like uh, team meetings and 5S and uh, simple problem solving tools, business process mapping, uh, total flow management, total quality management. These types of ideas you can implement. And if you only implement those tools, you'll get about 20% of the value. Where you get the rest of the value in a lean system is through enabling the culture to engage employees so that employees are interested, everyone, everywhere, every day in making the organization better. And that leads us to be wanting to talk about the people, to talk about the culture, to talk about leadership at all levels within an organization. We can't just focus on our team leaders. They're critical to our success, but that culture has to run throughout the, or the whole organization, right from the C-level suites, right down to the shop floor. We have to have everybody involved in making a new culture. And why do we need to do that? Well, we need to do that because what of our, one of the ideas that our friend uh, Albert Einstein uh, came up with. We cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. So we've heard this quote expressed in, in various ways in all likelihood uh, over our lifetimes. For instance, uh, one, one way to say that is uh, doing things the same way over and over again and expecting different results is the definition of insanity. Well, this all runs back to, uh, to our friend Albert Einstein. And what we want to do is we want to practice to change the way people think. Because when the people think differently, that new thinking will create new cultural practices. And when people start to practice new cultural activities, those practices will promote continuous improvement. We want to make sure that people are focused on improving every day, that it's part of their day-to-day -day life in their work workplace. And so this is what we're going to focus on here today. So let's introduce the Kaizen change model. So there's three pillars to the Kaizen change model. And the first pillar that we're going to talk about is uh, daily Kaizen. So that's where we concentrate on how do we develop people and sustain improvements in our workplaces, out in the Gemba where the work happens. So we're going to talk about daily Kaizen and some of the, uh, the tools and approaches that we, uh, that we have through daily Kaizen. We're also going to talk about culture from a leader's Kaizen perspective as we go through uh, this morning as well. And uh, the, some of the uh, leadership behaviors and some of the management systems that we can uh, put in place in order to lead by example. Uh, a critical aspect of uh, culture is leaders leading by example. So we'll talk about those two things. Those two pillars together allow us to perform breakthrough Kaizen, where we implement new paradigms. And paradigms is just a fancy word for the way we think about things or our mindsets and how we implement those and improve our processes through a problem solving culture. Uh, and just as a quick aside, we will be uh, presenting a webinar on problem solving the week after next. So if you, that is something that you're interested in, you might want to check back uh, on, with us uh, in a couple of weeks on problem solving. But first of all, let's talk about daily Kaizen. So in daily Kaizen, we have what we call in our organization a roadmap. And at level one of that roadmap, we look to organizations to implement some more organization in their teams. 
So we talk about uh, implementing some, uh, some simple things like team meetings, the daily uh, team huddle, if you will, uh, a routine where people meet very quickly, five to 15 minutes at the beginning of each day to talk about uh, what's going to happen in the team each day, for everybody to talk about their work plans, and for the leaders to update everybody on what, how things are going in the uh, organization. We we'll also talk about things like teamwork. <clears throat> we uh, we talk about how we react quickly to problems, and we also uh, want to implement leader standard work. You'll hear us talk about that quite a bit this morning. We'll talk about leader standard work for quick reaction. How do leaders get involved very quickly when problems happen out in the workplace? And then we move along uh, with our uh, daily Kaizen to level two, where we implement tools like 5S. We implement things like standardization. We implement leader standard work for process confirmation, or how do we know what we expect is happening out in the Gemba? What sort of audits or checks are we doing out in the Gemba? Then we move along to level three, where we standardize everything. All of the work processes that happen uh, get standardized, and we implement a cycle of standardize, do, check, act. We focus on improving team member skills. We focus on standardizing training processes for our organization. And we also Im implement leader standard work for training, work study, and problem solving as well. Once we get that done, we move along to our level four, where we introduce PDCA, or you might know it as the Schuert cycle, uh, where we plan, do, check, act and we implement uh, the PDCA to improve our processes. We start to focus on coaching and empowering people for improvement and developing tools like autonomous quality means. What practices do we put in out there at the workplace uh, in order to ensure that we're creating quality all the time? <laughs> and then we introduce a leader standard work for kata as well, or form. Those of you who are, are practice karate uh, will be familiar with kata or form. Uh, for, for doing what you do the same way all the time. So that's the daily Kaizen and all of that activity is designed to help us create a work culture that's focused on continuous improvement. So we have some tools, some techniques, uh, and we also start to introduce the idea of coaching and uh, communicating with people to focus on continuous improvement <coughs> continuously. Because here's where we need to get to. There's a lot of inertia in traditional organizations, particularly ones that have been in place for a long period of time. I think back to my career to a time when I worked in the pulp and paper industry. I worked in a, in a plant that, uh, that had been around for a long time. It had been around for the, since the 50s. And they had developed a work culture in there that was very deeply embedded that uh, didn't focus a, a great deal on continuous improvement. They were focused a great deal on staying the same all the time. And when it became apparent that they had to change, that they had to become more efficient, they had to become uh, 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 better every day at what they were doing, there was a lot of inertia due to that long-term uh, culture that they had developed to improve their working areas and processes. And it was one in which you had to overcome that inertia and put a huge amount of energy into changing the culture. <coughs> so they started doing that. And then they, what they did is they implemented some of these uh, changes that we're talking about, and they moved along until they got up to a different level where they started not just changing the Gemba, but they started changing behaviors with people. And what we need to do in order to make sure that we that we don't slide backwards on those things is get up to level three where we're reinforcing behaviors to change culture. And that's where we need to get to. And a lot of that kind of work uh, is, is contained in the conversations that we as leaders have with the people that we're working with. So we want to talk about that. What is the actual process that we need to go through in order to make sure that those, uh, those changes are actually happening out in the workplace? So we get into transformation. How do we transform into a Kaizen culture? Well, 
when you think about culture, how do we see that? I mean, there's, there's sometimes obvious things on the walls. You might see signs where organizations talk about visions or vision or values, things of that nature. But where we view culture probably at its most basic is through the behaviors that, that workers have every day out of there in the Gemba. And so you start with your current culture. Uh, and you, the organization desires that uh, the culture change a little bit. So in order to do that, what we have to do is institute new behaviors with people. <clears throat> and what that requires us to do is to change our mindset. How do we change mindsets in people? Well, we do that through communication. We do that through a different focus in the communication that we have with people every day. So that's part of the change that we need to make in order to introduce new behaviors. And along with those, uh, those changes in communication, the change in mindset that we're trying to get with workers, we also need to change the actual way they work. How do we do that? We implement the tools that we talked about. We implement things like 5S. We implement things like visual management practices. We implement leader standard work. We implement quick, uh, quick reaction to problems, a more focused way to problem solving. And what, when you combine the changes in the mindset together with changes in the way that people work, you get new behaviors and those new behaviors reinforced ends up giving us the new culture. So this is where we want to go with this uh, as we work along. I'm going to warn you, this does not happen overnight. Quite typically, we see three to five years required as these new behaviors and these new changes in the way that we work get internalized by staff and become part of the everyday life for everybody. It becomes uh, uh, an area where people forget the way that it used to be. They're so ingrained in the new culture and in the new continuous improvement culture that they've got that they start to forget about the way things were done before. And this becomes now the new way of working. And once we get there, we know that we're starting to uh, make some progress. <clears throat> so what is it that we see? We talked about changes in mindsets. We talked about changes in the way we work. So what do we see? Uh, out there quite often, we talk about the culture iceberg. So the culture iceberg is, is really, if you think about the entire iceberg, it's the price the organization has to pay or the energy that it has to put in for articles or services that don't meet customer requirements. And that shows up for us, the obvious things, the, the part that shows up above water as complaints, corrections, penalties, sometimes through scrap or defects and repairs. And the thing, the energy that has to go into it, the stuff that we don't see lies below the surface in our iceberg, such as management time, transport, urgencies. What is it that's taking up our time today? What are we prioritizing today? Financial costs. How is it that our customer, customers see our brand image? And also, are there things in effect that cause us to have loss of culture, cultures. All of this structure underneath, all of these policies, all of these things that take up our time, ends up showing up above the water in places that we can see them, such as what are listed on the, uh, on the chart uh, there that you see in front of you. So we wanna talk about how to change the culture in your organization. We wanna talk about a, a traditional organization such as the one we see defined by this iceberg and change it into one where we're focused on lean. We're focused on continuous improvement. We're focused on Kaizen. So here we see some differences, the iceberg in action. Some of the traditional leadership behaviors that we talk about, such as uh, short-term results focus. That's one in which uh, uh, leaders or or workers are rewarded on a very short term focus uh, for work that's done rather than having a long term focus that you need in order to make sure that the organization is successful and sustainable over the long term. 
we're not going to go through every one of these uh, with these behaviors, but we are going to pick out a couple of them and, and talk about the differences uh, for between traditional leadership behavior and lean leadership behavior. And one of which is, as you see halfway down the list there, is one is people that are, are costs. That's the way people are seen quite often in a traditional leadership uh, organization. And in a lean continuous organization, what we want to change to is people are seen as assets and they're seen as the best problem solvers that we have in the organization. We want to change the culture so that people are seen as problem solvers. People are seen as enablers of continuous improvement as opposed to costs. The other thing we want to talk about is leaders as uh, as coaches in a lean organization, as opposed to in traditional organization, leaders being the boss and telling people what to do on a on a day to day basis. We want to avoid situations where people check their brains in at the door and they come in and just do what they're told all day. In that type of a culture, there's never any focus on improvement. There's only focus on sustainability, on doing things the same way all the time. It's quite often focused on avoiding trouble. There's a culture of fear in the organization. And we want to move along to a culture of, of getting better every day. And one that's, uh, that's supportive of continuous improvement. So how can we do that? How can we change the culture in our organization from the traditional leadership behaviors that we see along to some of these lean leadership behaviors that we have on the slide in front of us. Well, one of the main tools that we have for that is our Leaders Kaizen. So we're going to talk about Leaders Kaizen for a period of time. We're going to talk about what leader behaviors and management systems are required to change the culture in the organization. What is it that we need to do? Because that's going to enable ultimately our Kaizen strategy and allow us to achieve the goals that we're set out to pick. And so here's our roadmap for uh, Leaders Kaizen. So we want to start out with engaging leaders. We want to ensure that leaders are on board with the, uh, with the path that we've chosen, one in which we want to introduce continuous improvement and become a Kaizen lean organization. So we spend the first little while talking about engaging the leaders ensuring that we're coaching them towards lean leadership behaviors. Then we want to go along and talk about go see. We want to get Gemba focused. We want to get leaders out into the workplace so that they can see where the value is actually created out there. We want leaders to look at value stream vision. Do they know where value is created in the organization? And also we want to along the way coach them, coach them for improvement in their Gemba in their Gemba uh, walks, coach them for improvement on their value stream vision. And then we want to ensure once we've got that underway, we want to make sure that we're driving the targets. Do we have the right KPIs for the organization? And through we, we go through a Hoshin Cannery process where we identify the KPIs that truly move the organization forward. Once we've got that in place, we go through visual performance management. We make sure that the visual uh, management that we've got supports the culture that we want to create inside the organization. Do people know where they're at on a on a day to day basis? Do people know uh, what's important on a day to day basis? Do we reinforce that visually? We also want to talk about moving along to sustaining change. What do we have to do? What type of audit practices? What type of uh, uh, layered process auditing do we need to do to in order that we're to ensure that we're sustaining the change that we have to people? And then finally, we want to excel. We want to run uh, reinforcement and maintenance workshops to ensure that uh, that people don't slide backwards, that we continue the the forward momentum for our organizations. So that's Leaders Kaizen. We're going to uh, uh, talk about how do we implement some of that. So we see the four levels on the left hand side there of uh, Leaders Kaizen that we talked about. Learning to see, driving the targets, achieving performance, sustaining the change. All of this depends on focused coaching. All of this depends on leadership being coached in such a way that they go out and coach the 
the people that are in the workplace. We need to make sure that our leaders are developing into coaches. And when people are interested in passing along skill development to the workers, when they're interested in ensuring that the, that the Gemba workers are, are getting better at what they do, and they're, they're doing that through coaching, we know that the organization is starting to be set up to get better every day. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to put together our railroad. What we have to do is ensure that in rail one is that uh, we're putting in place the physical or technical changes. We're putting in some of the tools such as 5S. We're putting in uh, Kanban. We're putting in uh, simple problem solving. We're putting in all of these tools that allow, uh, allow the processes to get better every day. And then in rail two, we need to have a new way to manage. We need to have ensure that we're putting in place visual controls. We're putting in place uh, metrics or KPIs. We're putting in place uh, Gemba walks. We're making it easy for people to know when they're being successful. We're putting in place all of these communication uh, devices in order to ensure that people know where they are every day. They know how the organization is doing and they know how they can become engaged and, and give their ideas into how to improve uh, the workplace. And then all of that, in order to hold it together, we have to have the rail ties. We need to have the discipline to sustain the gains that we're making through those first two steps. We need to input things like leader standard work. We talk about standard work quite a bit as though it only happens in out in the workplace. We have uh, people going through a process, we create a standard, they do the, the process the same way all the time. We need to bring that idea into leadership as well. We need to ensure that leaders have set programs that they go through uh, on a regular basis. That includes things like Gemba walks. It includes things like doing audits. It includes things like coaching uh, the folks that are, uh, that are out in the Gemba. All of these things put together starts to create a culture of lead. And all of these things put together starts to provide motivation for the idea gathering and the problem solving that is critical to having a good uh, lean system. And until we change the way we lead, until we change the things that are captured in uh, step three here on this slide, you can't expect different results. You cannot lead the same way and expect different results. That's the definition of crazy. So we need to introduce these things. So what's the turning point? We implement tools. We get to some of these things we've been talking about implemented out in the workplace. People start to put them in place, and especially when you uh, put in place things like 5S, where you put some workplace organization uh, into place, people start to get excited. They start to get a lot of energy going, and they start to love what they're doing. And that's where almost or all organizations drop the ball. They sort of wipe their hands and they say, we're done. We've got the tools in place. This is just going to run itself now. Everybody's happy with it. And they walk away and they start to lead in the same way as they did before. And that's when you see the backwards sliding. If you think about a turning point with lead, uh, if you think about what makes it happen, the engine for it is standard work for leaders, making sure that there are, there are steps that leaders need to take every day around uh, um, ensuring that things are happening in the Gemba the way they should. You need to have visual process controls because that's how people can get the information that they need in order to do their job well. You've got to have daily accountability through, uh, and you can do that through things like team meetings, Kaizen meetings uh, every morning, uh, perhaps daily, perhaps weekly, whatever works best for your organization. And then in order to make the whole thing run efficiently, you need leaders discipline, the discipline to go through standard work, the discipline that it takes for quick reaction when there's problems out in the workplace, the discipline to recognize people when they get good, good work, 
Because what's the, uh, what makes them die? Well, quite often it's around poor communication. We implement the tools, but we don't do the communication that it takes to keep those tools alive. Or we identify bad or, or even worse, have no metrics about how we're doing in our, uh, in our CI process. Or when things get difficult, when uh, the proverbial stuff hits the fan, so to speak, you go back and do things the way you used to do them instead of doing them in a disciplined, lean way. Never mind this one time. Once you commit to lean, you have to commit to the process. If you go back to the old ways of doing things, when things get difficult, you lose your momentum, culture doesn't change. If you don't have top management support for it, if it's seen as just a, sort of a, a program uh, that's being done uh, sort of on the workplace and leadership doesn't really get involved, that'll quite often be a place where it dies. Or there's no ownership for the improvement. Nobody's responsible for it. You don't have a champion uh, at some level that's responsible for your lean initiatives. That can be a problem. Going back to uh, problem solving by gut feel or intuition, uh, that can be a problem. Part of the Kaizen tools is the simple problem solving, things like using fishbone diagrams or 5Y processes, uh, using 3C uh, processes, A3 processes. If we go back to problem solving by gut feel, that can cause us to slide backwards. Or if we don't put the time in to, uh, to implement our improvements, that can be a problem. So what do leaders need to do? Let's talk about that. What do we actually need to do on a day-to-day -day basis in order to make, uh, make this work better? And the answer to that is transformational coaching. We need to set up an organization inside our companies where we are focused on transformational coaching. How do we pass along skills from one person to another in order to ensure that we're changing culture, we're changing mindsets, we're changing behaviors, which ends up changing the long-term culture. And all of that begins with the quality of the conversations that we have. So I'm going to put on uh, sort of my communications hat here for a little bit. We're going to talk for a brief period of time about how we can improve the quality of our conversations. Because you can't talk about coaching unless you talk about how do we, how do we actually speak with people. Conversations are the main tool of leadership. If you think about it carefully, almost everything that you do begins and ends with a conversation. So that's our main tool as leaders. So we want to talk about that a little bit. And leadership and conversation, it sort of had three tools uh, that we're going to talk about here this morning. We're going to talk about advocacy. We're going to talk about uh, the, the act of putting your point across to people. Uh, it sounds pretty simple, and most of us have been doing this uh, all of our lives, but are we doing taking all the right steps with it? Are we advocating or, or getting across our idea in such a way that people can hear it and in such a way that people feel engaged by it? We'll talk about that for just a little bit. We'll also talk about listening. Uh, listening probably being uh, the most important part of a conversation. It sounds a, a little bit strange to talk about the most important part of your conversation is when you're not talking. But, but it is actually that in order to engage people, in order to have people uh, engage in what you would like to speak about, you need to be able to listen to them. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And thirdly, we're going to talk about inquiry or the act of actually asking questions with people. All three of these are doorways into a conversation and we'll talk about how all of those things fit together. So listening. 
there's four levels of of listening, and the one then the first one is is actively not listening. I'm sure you're all uh, all familiar with this, where you walk into somebody's office, uh, they're plunking away on a computer, they're uh, or they're talking on a telephone, and uh, you're standing there and might even be talking to this person if they're on the computer, and they might be nodding, but they're not listening. So that's the first level of listening. The second one is pretending. So that's you get the nod and grunt, but you can see in the person's eyes that they're really not uh, sort of taking in. They're they're distracted. They're uh, they're not paying attention. There's trigger listening, and that's where a person uh, pretends to listen until such time as uh, you come up uh, and say something that they're really interested in, and they go, "Oh, that reminds me of something." and then they suddenly become engaged in your conversation. And lastly, you have pure listening, and that's what we're going to talk about a little bit. Some simple steps to make sure you improve your listening skill. So first of all, pay attention. Uh, what you want to do is ensure that you're facing the person, that the, you have good eye contact, that you're uh, asking questions at uh, particular times during the uh, conversation and that you're utilizing empathy. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit uh, more as we go along. The third step in pure listening is to resist interruption or hijacking of the conversation. And lastly, to ensure understanding. So let's look at each one of those steps shortly. First of all, pay attention. Ensure that you're facing the speaker, maintaining eye contact, that you're attentive but relaxed, uh, if you get right up into somebody's face uh, as you're as you're listening to them, that can that can serve to be distracting for people. So you want to stay relaxed. And for the love of everything holy, please put your phone in your pocket. Uh, um, pet peeve of mine is uh, when I'm having a conversation with somebody and the text goes off and they're suddenly focused on the text instead of the conversation that we're having, because. What does that say to a person? It says whoever's on the on the other end of the phone is more important than you are. So leave your phone in your pocket. And if it's going to be a long conversation, perhaps even turn the ringer off uh, so that you're not tempted to be distracted by things like that. So pay attention. Secondly, utilize empathy. When you're listening to a person, feel free to, to say things like, oh, that's terrible. That must have made you mad. Uh, or ask questions, how did you feel about that? Because what that allows the person to, that you're having a conversation with to do is sort of release the feeling and focus more on the subject matter. When they know you understand the emotion behind something they say, it allows them to engage in the conversation better. So utilize empathy. And remember, empathy is different from sympathy. Empathy means you're just recognizing how the other person feels. Doesn't mean you're taking on the feeling. OK, so the example here, empathy is that must make you feel sad. Sympathy is what you're telling me makes me sad. So that's the difference between those two things. You want to utilize empathy <coughs> in your conversations. Then you want to talk about uh, resisting interruption. Let people finish their train of thoughts before uh, putting what you want to say in there. Wait for natural pauses. Avoid that reminds me. Oh, by the way, don't that that changes the focus from what the other person is saying into your agenda. Let them finish their thoughts. And avoid offering solutions unless a person asks for one. <coughs> Something else that you want to do, the last step in pure listening, is to ensure understanding. You might use terms like, uh, what I hear you saying is, what do you mean when you say? You want to paraphrase. You want to get acknowledgement that you actually do understand what it is that a person is, is saying. And lastly, before, and this is the longest uh, that we're going to talk about conversations, uh, you want to help them get pure. Pick the right time. If you've got an important message to pass along to somebody, pick the right place, pick the right time, and pick the right communication medium. The more critical a conversation is, the closer you want to get to a person. 
for those most critical conversations, you want to actually deliver those face to face. Have the conversation face to face. When it's less important, you can do it over the phone. And when you're really just passing along information, <clears throat> you can do that over an email. But ensure you, you pick the right place. The next step is advocacy. So reducing the facade. So advocacy is the art of getting across what you're thinking to people. So some of the steps in that, first of all, you want to state your point of view. And we're going to say have a look at the uh, an example of this here in a minute. You want to describe the data that you're using. <clears throat> and then the step that everybody misses all the time is testing your conclusion. For instance, here's an example. You would start with your advocacy by stating your point of view. I believe we should reduce the standard work week in North America to 36 hours. I would then go along to explain my data. The reasons I think we should do this is there'd be more employment, reduced commuting, people with better rest are more productive, and it'd be a boon to the golfing industry. Now, quite often people will leave it there, <clears throat> but what you need to do is test your conclusion. Ask the question, can you see any flaws with my reasoning? Can you think about what I said and, and give me some feedback on it? That's the step that people miss when they're, when they're doing advocacy quite often. When you're stating your point of view on something, test your conclusion, ask for challenge on what you're thinking. That engages people in your conversation. And what will end up happening is you'll get better ideas and you'll get what you'll do is be able to massage your ideas and, and really get the best uh, efforts out of it. So that's the steps behind advocacy. Inquiry is reducing our blind spot. <clears throat> Inquiry is the act of asking questions. So what you want to do is you want to ask your question. You want to explain your reasons for inquiring and then check your understanding. Explain your reasons for inquiry is read because that's the step that people miss most often when they're asking questions. And when you don't tell people why you're asking a question, quite often what that can build is a distrust in people. So you want to make sure that you include that step. And the other thing you want to be careful with is why. If you ask a question that starts with why, quite often that'll invoke a, uh, uh, a trust uh, sort of disconnect with people to start wondering about why are you asking this question? So what you want to do is volunteer your uh, reasons for inquiring. For example, uh, here's a question. Yesterday I read your proposal concerning a new maintenance schedule. Can you tell me the reasoning behind it? And I then want to explain my reasons for asking that question. The reason I'm asked is I'm concerned that the schedule is aggressive and we may not be able to completely finish the work. And then you want to listen and follow up as necessary. So those are the steps in quality inquiry. And what you want to ensure is that you're explaining the reasons that you're asking the question in the first place, because that allows the trust level to stay high in the conversation. And so listening, advocacy inquiry. You need to balance those things in your conversations in order to make sure that that conversation tool that is your main tool as a leader stays sharp and stays focused. So conversation contractions. This is another area that we want to talk about before we leave conversations. So Here's a statement. I'm not going to put up with their nonsense anymore. If they can't communicate better, we just can't be expected to put in the effort required to be successful. This statement contains a lot of vague words, and those vague words I call a conversation contraction. There are words in there where I'm not really sure what they mean, and let's look at some of the examples of that. Nonsense. When this person uh, says nonsense to me, I need to understand exactly what it is that that, that, that that word means to them. So I need to ask a question about that. Well, you say that there's nonsense going on. Can you give me some examples of that? Uh, 
Another word is communicate. When you say they can't communicate better, what are you talking about? Are you, are you talking? Are you getting emails, or, or is it actually a, a conversation with that you're having with somebody, or are you lacking something? What do you mean when you say if they can't communicate better? Another example: we. Who's we? You say we can't be successful. Are you talking about your team? Are you talking about uh, you and, and your buddy? Who, who exactly is contained when you talk about we? And then finally, successful. What does success look like? When you say you can't be successful, what is it that you want to achieve? So all of those things are called conversation contractions. So you want to be looking for those as well in your conversation. So putting it all together, what you want to do in your conversations, you want to make sure you're, you're practicing pure listening skills, you're practicing quality advocacy by asking for challenge or, or asking for people's feedback on, uh, on what it is that you're putting forward. You want to practice quality inquiry by explaining why you're asking the questions that you're asking. And finally, when somebody is speaking to you and they're using some conversation contractions, you want to make sure you clarify and find out uh, exactly what they mean by those words. So those are the steps in our quality conversation. So getting back to uh, to culture and getting back to uh, uh, lean, what's the turning point with lean progress for us? Well, when we can answer these questions that are put on the slide here, do workers understand what is important? When you can go out into the Gemba and, and ask workers about what are the KPIs that are most important here, and they can actually answer those questions, you know you're starting to make progress. What are your leaders' conversations like? Are they coaching or are they just telling people what to do? Are they inviting engagement? Are they inviting ideas? Or is all of the conversation one way? When, when you've got this exchange of ideas going on out in the workplace that's powered by quality conversations, you know you're making progress. Where are your leaders spending their time? Are they out there in the Gemba seeing what's going on? Are they out there uh, helping, being part of a help chain so that problems get solved uh, quickly? Or are they locked up in their offices? Uh, when, you, when you've got a good balance between Gemba work and, uh, and time spent in the office, you know you're making progress. Are you measuring the right things? During your Hoshin Cannery process, do you come up with good KPIs? Are you leading or are you chasing? All of these things are critical uh, and will be an indicator that you're making uh, changes in your culture. We want to ask ourselves, what behaviors are we driving? What is it that we're supporting? Lean can be difficult, not because it's, it's complex. It's really quite simple. As we go through uh, belt training classes, I facilitate belt training classes uh, quite often, and people invariably start to talk about all oh, this stuff is just common sense. And it really is. It's not complex, but it's different than what people are used to doing. And that's what makes it hard. People resist change. Sometimes they resist change involuntarily. They don't even know they're doing it. So that's why we have to put in place the, uh, the tools and the methodologies to ensure that we can change culture. So in our structure and our processes, what we want to make sure is that we're, we're creating a good decision-making environment. We're creating good workplace organization. We're putting in place the visual management uh, that's required to uh, for people to know what's uh, what's important, and also that we're focused on coaching. If you haven't seen uh, our webinar on daily kaizen, you might want to go to our YouTube channel, and you can find the YouTube channel if uh, in YouTube you search for Kaizen Institute North America. And you can have a look at some of the com components of Daily Kaizen and our webinar there. And th they're focused on team organization, workplace organization. They're focused on standardization and then the uh, continuous improvement cycle or PDCA. These are all of the elements of di Daily Kaizen. If I want to change culture, I have to put these tools in place and I have to back it up with um, 
motivational uh, uh, elements such as incentives and recognition. We want to make sure that we're rewarding the right behavior because what gets recognized gets repeated. If uh, a worker has uh, changed something and we've got a, a result that we want to repeat, we want to recognize that. And what gets rewarded gets repeated many, many times. And, it, and it's really surprising uh, at how uh, uh, sort of insignificant sometimes that reward can be and yet still act as, uh, as a motivator uh, for people. I, I used to, a uh, stupid story, I used to run a poker league and uh, the poker league would run from September to April. And I used to get out, I'd buy at the dollar store little stars and anybody who showed up every week for the poker league would get one of these little stars. And it was amazing the the steps that people would go through to get one of these little stars at the end of the year it was crazy but it's it's this idea that what gets rewarded gets repeated for people all the time those incentives affect behavior and performance and what we want to recognize is that we want to be hard on our processes and easy on our people when we do run into problems it's the process that we want to focus on Quite often what we do is we look around for somebody to blame. Once we've got somebody to blame, we just move on because, oh, well, it was so-and-so's fault. What we want to do is get down to the place in our processes where we're identifying where did this process let, let us down so that this undesirable uh, sort of event could happen. We want to be hard on the processes, easy on the people. And then we want to talk about the people themselves. We want to encourage new thinking. How do we do that? By putting the tools and putting the coaching in place to, to engage people. We do that through encouraging quality conversations. We do that through inviting feedback. How can we do this better? And then acting on that feedback when we get it. We do this through Gemba-based problem solving by engaging the people who are actually involved in the process in our problem solving instead of doing it in isolation in an office someplace. And then finally, we want to ensure that we coach people through that as well. And then we want to talk about uh, support. Uh, quite often what can happen when we go through uh, some sort of a transformation where we want things to be significantly different at the, uh, at the end of it, it will be helpful to have leader support groups. For leaders to get together on a, on a weekly basis, uh, whatever sort of uh, uh, timing works uh, best for that group, to talk about the challenges that we're facing and to get ideas from other leaders in the organization on what they did when they faced something similar. This can be a critical part of, uh, of culture change is ensuring that the leaders who are out there trying to move the the organization forward are supporting each other and that they don't feel isolated or that they're the only ones dealing with it. You want to copy success. If you're getting good success in one department, copy that success. What did they do to get there? How can we implement that in the, uh, in the next uh, department? Invest in coaching. Ensure that uh, people are following a, a, a good program. Find and use mentors. If there's people in your organization that are a shining example of, of this leader behavior that you're looking for, use them as mentors. Have them uh, help some of, the, uh, some of the younger or some of the newer members of the leadership staff to get better. All of these are tools that you can use to change the culture in your organization. Pay attention to things like the, the Kaizen Roadmap. Have a plan. Uh, and spend time on that plan on a regular basis. Ensure that it's, it stays current. Don't just introduce it once and then don't go back to it again. What you want to make sure is it becomes top of mind for everybody all the time. So your culture in your organization, you know it's changing when you do it without noticing it. It just happens automatically. That's when you know it's changing. You do it when you're under the gun. When there's trouble in the organization and you do it the lean way, you do it in such a way as that you're using formal problem solving, et cetera, you know that your culture's changing. People do it when they're tired. You're in the eighth day of a maintenance turnaround. 
and people are still practicing some of these uh, some of these concepts you know you're you're making progress in your organization you do it when you're caught off guard the people do it automatically all these are indicators of culture change and finally you don't remember the, the old way of doing something that's a sure sign of culture change and people just do it because they know it's right so here's my challenge to you how are you going to start what are you going to do differently tomorrow or after you get up from this webinar what are you going to do to start your own journey along that uh, transformation so write that down just take a pen and paper and say i am going to change this in order to, to do my bit to try to transform the culture in my organization. Enough people in your organization do that, pretty soon you've got a new organization. That, uh, that ends the uh, webinar. Uh, so uh, we'll be turning this over to Jesse here again if there's uh, any questions. I uh, just want to draw your attention that there are uh, online uh, training webinars coming up and uh, if you look to our web page we've got two coming up next week uh, but uh, Jesse I'm sure we'll be sending out more information about that and I'll turn it over now for questions All right, well, thanks thanks everyone uh, for being on uh, today's call. We do have a couple questions that are published, but before we get into those, uh, we just wanted to quickly touch base. Uh, in the background here, we know several organizations that were trying to log into today's call uh, were experiencing a few problems uh, with their Teams account uh, being able to switch over to this live event. Uh, so in the background here, we've also been uh, uh, communicating with our leadership team at Kaizen Institute North America. And in the email that comes out after today's call, a couple things are going to be there. One uh, is we're obviously going to give you the links to see this entire uh, presentation uh, as well as the the presentation itself uh, both will be posted on our linkedin group uh, and uh, will be available for you to see uh, but in addition to that uh, we're offer also going to offer uh, a very special uh, special countermeasure uh, today which is if you uh, would really like this to be presented uh, for you at your organization totally free of charge please just reach out to us uh, from that email and we will schedule a date and time uh, in the future that we join in a call uh, for your team and provide this uh, this uh, presentation for you all. Uh, so again, we, we do apologize anyone that was having having an issue getting in, uh, but uh, we definitely want to make sure that you have this information. So we're we're going to do whatever we can to, to make that uh, make that right for everyone. So thanks for hanging in there. Uh, so Chuck, a couple questions did come in. So uh, we had one question that says, uh, should I advise my team to withhold improvements uh, or improvement projects until they have standards and a stabilized process? Uh, well, my answer to that is uh, you should uh, definitely standardize those processes. Uh, would I hold it back until I could do that? Uh, I would probably implement the, the projects uh, with a view towards standardizing them once they're done. If you think about uh, a, a Kaizen event, quite often what you'll do is you'll do the problem solving, you'll do the work, and then once you, you check that you're getting the results that you desire, then you'd standardize it. Uh, I would not hold back the improvement while I wait to standardize it first. Put the improvement in place when you're getting the results that you desire, then standardize the new process. You're on mute, Jesse. We had an additional question. Uh, Kelsey asks us, Chuck, what aspects of Kaizen culture uh, have you found most difficult for organizations to embrace? And what aspects of Kaizen culture uh, have you observed as the most challenging for organizations to sustain? Okay, uh, thanks for that question. Uh, so where I've found it the most challenging is in organizations where they've tried it before. 
they've undergone some type of a, a continuous improvement effort, perhaps instituted some of the tools. They did not put into place the, the cultural supports that you need to do. They didn't change the way they, they spoke with people. They didn't uh, introduce or, or keep going the, the regular meetings that you need to do to, to maintain the organization. They didn't put into place uh, uh, the change in conversation. Uh, that you have to have with people in order to make sure that you engage. That's uh, where I've seen the most difficulty in making this happen. You want to do it once, you want to do it correctly the first time, because when you do it a second time, it becomes sort of doubly difficult. It's not impossible, but you just have to spend more time doing it. And also where I where I find, find the most sort of pushback uh, is in the middle of the organization, that sort of middle management level. We have to remember when we're asking people to change that we're invoking some level of fear in them. And we're also passing along the message to people that what they've been doing to this point <coughs> isn't necessarily the best way to handle things. And when you talk about <clears throat> people in the middle management level, quite often they've got quite a number of years behind them where they've been very successful doing what they're doing. And as a result of that, they've been promoted uh, a few times up into middle management level. You go to that level and say, you need to change now. And they, they throw their hands up and say, oh, wait a minute, I've been successful doing what I'm doing here. And, and that's where you can find a lot of the pushback quite often. So you need to have sort of a special effort at that level in the organization in order to ensure that you get the, overcome the inertia, overcome the pushback that you might have to the change as well. Well, and that wraps up, uh, that wraps up our uh, questions that we had here in the QA uh, QA area, uh, and again, we thank you uh, very much, Chuck, for for providing us uh, with your insight today uh, and and giving us uh, you know this this great information. And again, to everyone, uh, so we do we do want everybody to to stay well and and not lose uh, any focus on continuing to improve any even in these uh, difficult times. So please, uh, when you see this survey, let us know uh, how how we're doing. And again, uh, if you have interest in this being presented no cost at all uh, for your specific organization please just message us back and we'll work out a date and time that that works so thanks everyone for attending today and we hope to see you on another webinar soon thanks everybody